you're yeah. an enemy of the peace. When I went to my Harvard reunion <laughs> 10 days ago, the only person name checked in the off the record session on China that included a Harvard professor, a Harvard law school professor, and a Harvard business school professor was you because you scare one of them for your existential threat language. So tell me about that. Why are you trying to scare China into a war? Well, it's interesting. After our, our first hearing, which was profoundly bipartisan, uh, I think Fareed Zakaria accused me of being a neo-McCarthyite. Uh, and then there was a series of op-eds uh, accusing the committee of being dangerously bipartisan, i.e. that the, the hawkish consensus was, was too scary. I think there's... Um, an effort underway, and the Biden administration is, a, is probably at the leading edge of this now, to uh, make this thaw in U.S.-China relations a reality. The president has predicted a thaw in relations. The problem is every time we sort of ardently attempt to engage with the CCP, any time we pull a punch for fear of provoking the CCP, they just spit in our face, and they grow more aggressive across the board. And how much more evidence do we need? We've seen what well, we've seen recently. We've seen them buzz our planes in the Pacific, uh, sail dangerously close to our destroyers. There was the Volt Taiwan cyber attack on Guam. There was the raid of the Bain and Company corporate office. There was the regulatory action against um, uh, against Micron. Uh, and now we have revelations of their intent to build a massive spying facility in Cuba. So across the board. We are seeing Chinese Communist Party aggressiveness, and we're failing to see that our fear of provocation is itself provocative. So I'm just trying to tell the truth. I'm just trying to say, hey, we have an increasingly hostile, aggressive foreign adversary that's trying to undermine our sovereignty, that's trying to take Taiwan by force. And if we don't wake up to this fact, we're going to stumble into a war for which we're ill-prepared. Now, that offends all your you Harvard types here. Well, I the apologize. escalatory cycle I'm going to get to, but I do want to say the most astonishing thing, Mr. Chairman, is that if you had the Uyghurs on your bingo card, you didn't get a letter. Because in an hour and a half, three Harvard and lots of Harvard people in the audience, no one mentioned the Uyghurs. It's like going to a conference on Germany in 1937 and no one mentioning the Jews. What is the deal with that? Aren't Democrats upset about this? I think uh, people are afraid of retaliation. They're afraid of the economic coercion that would ensue if you have the temerity to say, as now two administrations have, Republican and Democrat, that there's an ongoing genocide in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. I, was, I think I've talked with you before, Hugh. When we went out to Hollywood with the committee, we had this off-the-record dinner with a bunch of uh, Hollywood producers, and without naming names, they said, I asked, I asked them, if, if you were asked in public, is there a genocide happening in Xinjiang? What would you say? And they all said, well, I do not want to answer that question because not only would I be punished, my entire studio would get punished and we'd never be able to do business in China. Again, the same is true for the university uh, system, right? I mean, uh, Chinese students are very lucrative for universities. Foreign donations from China are very lucrative for universities. So I think people fear offending the CCP for fear of the economic retaliation that would ensue, which is all part of the Chinese Communist Party's attempt to control our discourse, to use their, the commanding heights of their economy, of their technology, to affect what we are allowed to say and what we are not allowed to say. The whole thing is, is Orwellian. I mean, actually, I think it would make Orwell blush in terms of the censorship and self-censorship that's happening on a daily basis because people are afraid to stand up to the CCP. Yeah, you know, one of the um, arguments in this off-the-record panel, which I had hoped was going to be off-the-record so people would say bad things about China, but it was in fact off-the-record because they were afraid they didn't appease enough, uh, is that uh, Taiwan will reunify with China peacefully. Don't worry, they'll grow together. And I, I just say to myself, are they not paying attention? Okay, so if you live in Taiwan, and let's say you were brought up thinking that, well, something happened recently that would completely upend your view of, let's even call it peaceful reunification, which is the phrase that uh, Xi Jinping uses, because he has no intent to do it peacefully. Uh, well, he'd prefer to do it peacefully, but I don't think the people of Taiwan are going to let him do it, because they saw what happened in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong and the CCP's takeover of Hong Kong completely eviscerated the idea of one country, two systems. So this idea that somehow they're going to peacefully reunify and the CCP will let Taiwan retain its vibrant democracy and its political system is a total, total farce. And everybody in Taiwan knows it. And so we shouldn't be under any illusions about this fact. This is, seems like a very interesting panel that oh, you're on I, here. I also, I've told you this before, and I want to make sure I put it in here. We had a uh, question from the audience which suggested 
that we were responsible for World War II and the attack on Pearl Harbor because we cut off Japan via the blockade. And a hand went up, and thank God there was a CIA case officer retired who had spent 40 years at the agency he said, we didn't do that. In fact, Japan invaded Manchuria in 1933. I said, hallelujah, but the panel didn't say that. They went into this yeah. escalation. We are causing the escalation. Yeah. Japan invaded, I believe, after having signed the Kellogg Brand Pact, yes. which was an attempt to outlaw oh, don't war. Don't go using facts. Yeah. <laughs> I think three signatories of the Kellogg Brand Pact violated it within five years, which tells you that a naive utopian attempt to use multilateral institutions to outlaw war will never work. Only force of arms and peace of strength will. But I digress, Hugh. Um, yeah, this, now you're getting – this is where I think the um, – the sort of misguided attempt to revive diplomatic and economic engagement in the Biden administration collides with the ideology of the far left. And the ideology of the far left is that America is to blame yes. for most of our problem, which then collides with the ideology of the Chinese Communist Party, which says that America is a neo-imperialist, uh, systemically racist hellscape and therefore has no moral credibility to be leader of the free world such as it exists, which is why we need to be very, very wary of allowing the CCP to dominate our digital platforms because they spread this propaganda nonsense all over Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. And these are platforms that, of course, your average Chinese citizen does not have access to. Are you making progress with the legacy media to at least report the underlying, the biggest underlying story in China is the genocide. It's a million people. Are you making any progress in getting them to care? Well, we had a hearing on the ongoing genocide, which is pretty powerful. We actually had survivors testify. And my ranking member and I, Raja Krishnamurthy, who's a uh, inveterate Bears fan, but besides that, it's great to work with. Uh, knows a little bit about football. Yeah, knows a lot about losing, that is for sure. Um, uh, we did a series of joint interviews, and, you know, uh, w we went on CNN and a variety of other shows, and they were willing to talk about it. So perhaps that represents progress. But I I've never seen sort of in-depth reporting on it on the mainstream media channel. I mean, look at, look at even more, uh, n let's say, newsy things. Uh, the, the mainstream media was unwilling to report on the fact that the, uh, the pandemic most likely uh, originated from a lab at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Across the board, it's just this... This, 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 um, this fear of provoking the Chinese Communist Party that affects not just politicians, but also uh, people that are influential in the American media. Do you think it's like the interwar period? Uh, because th th there was a self-censorship that went on in the West yeah. about the Nazis. And I do believe the CCP is a totalitarian regime that is killing people, but we're not talking about it. It's just like a deja vu all over again. I think the, the best case scenario in terms of historical analogies is that it's 1979, right? You know, there's a series of crises across the board. board. There's an energy crisis, you know, domestic malaise, et cetera, et cetera. And then we finally elect someone who has a realistic view of the world and can turn some of these things around, a la Reagan. I think the worst case scenario is that it's actually the interwar period. And we see a resurgence of utopianism. On the left, a la Kellogg Brand Pact, we see um, a lot of self-hating ideology here in America, and we see a continued willingness to fund our own destruction uh, by sending American capital to China in order to invest in Chinese military-affiliated companies, in order to invest in tech companies that are helping them perfect their ability to conduct genocide. And for fear of not upsetting the golden goose here, killing the golden goose, we don't want to fundamentally change One and minute. selectively How decouple. How do we get Apple out of China? I mean, how do we do this? We went and talked. We went to uh, Apple headquarters with the committee. Uh, they claim they are trying to de-risk, that's sort of the new term of the moment. I'll concede the point that Apple can't take all of the Foxconn facilities and overnight move them to India uh, and Vietnam. I mean, it's, that's going to take a long time to, to, to rebalance their supply chain. But I think the more we put bipartisan pressure on industry, and the more we just tell the truth about the risks, both short-term and long-term, about doing business in China, I think the more we can push these companies to find other places to make cheap phones. Chairman Mike Gallagher, um, there is no losing in sports, no but there is no winning. No, that's it. That's Giannis. Thank you for being here.